Hey there, welcome to the Starting a Counseling Practice Podcast, where we get connected with amazing therapists around the world, and they share their story of becoming therapists and starting successful private practices that they love and having lives that they love. Today, I'm really excited that we get to talk to Abby Stangmeister about her experience of becoming a therapist, opening her successful practice, and how she's using Instagram effectively, how it's not just a time suck for her, like it is for many other therapists out there. Welcome, Abby. Hi, thank you for having me. I'm super excited. Of course, of course. Do you want to share with everybody um, your web address and where you're located and the specialty of your practice? Yeah, so my web address, um, you can just find me at Evolving Whole. And I am located in New Jersey, but I'm licensed in New Jersey, Pennsylvania, and Florida. And the area that I'm kind of working with now, I used to work with a lot of people of all ages, but I've dialed it in. Um, And I really like my focus on professionals, students, people that are big dreamers who are driven to make some changes in their life. And oftentimes they feel like they're on this like hamster wheel like Monday through Friday, weekend comes, they do something fun, but then it's like, oh, Sunday scaries, like back to it. They're not feeling fulfilled in all aspects of their life. So maybe they want to like drive more in their career or their relationships or in their hobbies. And they just don't know how to get there. Mm, I love that. I love that. And I think it's always an interesting thing, how often the people we're working with also mirror part of our journey too. And so Mm -hmm. I'm excited to maybe delve into that stuff a little bit too. Awesome. Yeah. Yeah. And that's kind of why I like that because that's part of like going into private practice and like who I am as a person is like having that, although it's never like a complete balance, but how can you have like fulfillment every day and contentment every day? Yeah. Yeah. And I think that's the piece that so many people are missing. Like what does fulfillment mean versus like success? You know, like, oh, I have a full caseload, but like, what does that matter if I don't feel good in my body or when I'm at home or when I shut my eyes at the end of the night, like, what is, what is the point? Right. Right. And then it's suddenly we're like, okay, well then let's find happiness in my life. And we're like, oh, that's working. And it's like, oh, my business is falling apart. Okay. Let me focus over here. And it's just Mm -hmm. this like weird, um, you know, like pendulum Yeah, Yeah. pendulum or seesaw where you're just like up and down and it's like, ugh doesn't feel good. Um, so I always like to start and kind of, um, start with this question and a minute or less, why did you decide to become a therapist? I feel like it was always a part of me and that sounds cheesy, but it's something, I mean, at a young age, it just, I didn't know what a therapist was until like, I kind of got to high school and like we had peer counselors and I was like, this feels great. And at one point in my life, I went to a therapist and I was like, this feels good. Like to have someone who can just be my sounding board. And so it felt like that was the right path. And then I kind of detoured off that path Mm. for a little bit because I found other passions. And after undergrad, I wasn't sure. And then I was working in other businesses and I was like, no, this is, this is what I'm meant to do and meant to be. Mm. And I just like took a, a jump to go do it. I had a week to apply to university of Penn. I was living in Philadelphia at the time. I found the program I wanted. I had a week to take the GREs, get my application in and di- just went for it. And yeah, that was it. One program. And I was like, if I get in, it's meant to be. Okay, Abby, you have no idea how many weird like continuity there is of like your story and mine. Like absolutely. Like again, I was a kid, people were like, oh, like I want to be a psychologist. I'm like, I don't even know what a psychologist was. Like, how did I do that? Peer counselor in high school. Um, got done with undergrad, had no kind of idea of how to do it, had been working full time. And I didn't end up taking like a big break, but I was literally like, oh, I missed, I didn't know there was a deadline for grad school. And like, I missed the deadline. And I started looking at social work and teaching programs and all these other things. And then somebody um, was like, well, hey, actually there was this piece of paper where somebody put the wrong time. So if you can apply in the next week, we can like get you in for this. We can like put you in and get you in for an interview possibly. And I took my GREs with like 
10 days notice and like the whole thing. And it was the only thing that I applied to because it was the only thing that like I could do in my life that like worked where I was working. So, oh my gosh. Look at us. And I didn't tell and I didn't tell anyone. Like I kept it this big secret. Like my mentor knew I kept it like a huge secret. And then I ended up finding out, and my mom was coming up to visit. And I like rushed to Penn, bought a t-shirt. She's like, Why are you running around like the day before? And I opened and she opened up the t-shirt. She's like crying. She's like, I don't, what is this shirt? And I was like, I'm starting at Penn to become a therapist. Like it was, it was one of the best moments of my life. But it was so exciting. Yeah. Oh, and like she yeah. really got you oh that makes me cry yeah like she really like got you and like knew it and supported you through that process yeah yeah oh yeah. that's so beautiful oh what a beautiful moment okay so from the time that you like started pen mm-hmm. how long did it take you from that moment to finish and get licensed uh, Ooh. <laughs> so it's <laughs> so we right. know each state is completely different yes. I knew I was going to be getting my LPC I also did a dual program in school counseling. Mm -hmm. So I'm certified as a school counselor. Um, I've never practiced as one. I did intern at schools in Philadelphia. Um, So in Pennsylvania, you can work with a master's degree until you get licensed. Mm -hmm. In New Jersey, you sit for your exam and then you get like what's called an LAC and then you have so many hours, then you get licensed Mm -hmm. um, like to work on your own. I worked in Pennsylvania and then I needed to move back to the beach because that's my life. So I worked Mm. two years in PA and then moved to New Jersey and had to pretty much start over. I was able to count some of those hours, but I was in this weird in-between stage. So I worked here still with a master's without having my LAC in a way. And I was Mm. still driving all the way up to Philly. Mm. Um, So... I want to say it took me like three years to get all of the hours in and figure out like the paperwork, like it's, you know, and then wait, you know, so all of that and take the exam. So I want to say it took me about three years after graduating. And it's such an interesting thing that I think most people, when they start the process, they don't think, oh, I'm going to go to school. And then whatever I'm learning in school, if I decide to move to another state, I'm, I might have to start from scratch or I'm going to have to like go through a whole nother process. I think like, it's sort of like, I almost wish that more graduate schools were like, Hey, by the way, Mm -hmm. are you sure about this state? (laughs) Like, are you sure you want to be here? Right. Um, Right. Because like, there's some, some bits of research that get lost in the the process. Yeah. Like I took the NCE exam because that was like really I knew about the other one and I forget the initials for the other national licensing. Um, and now I'm looking to get licensed in a few other states and I don't have that exam and they, on, they don't take the NCE. They only take this other one. Um, yeah. But I never really knew about it. It might not have really existed. <laughs> I don't know if it existed like 10 years ago or not. Um, I so now I think that's something for professionals. Like if you're just starting out to look at like the licensing, if you want to have multiple states, whatever that mm-hmm. it's like NCH something. Yeah. Um, for the LPC, uh, to look into. Cause I'm like, I don't know if I want to sit for that exam. <laughs> well, is it this really is the... that important to me to be licensed in that state, you know, which is and a I, shame. I will say this too, which is interesting. I have for a long time, really been a proponent of go and get a master's degree, get the cheapest one you can possibly get. Um, and then focus on if you have extra, if you have more that you want to invest, invest that in like postgraduate certifications or advanced study. Mm -hmm. Like don't go and pay a hundred or $200,000 for this. Like it doesn't make sense. Like the the ROI is not there. There's a little bit, if somebody is looking to like kind of be nomadic, I wonder if doing a program that would qualify for the SIPAC where they're Mm -hmm. working towards um, the psychology license is really working towards reciprocity and they have like eight states or something so far and they're really advocating in the way Mm -hmm. that LPC, MFT, MHC are not doing suddenly I think there's something about that if somebody wants a lot of flexibility but I also think it's interesting like I have clients that have multiple licenses in multiple states they're like this is great so I can see anybody from anywhere and then they're spending so much time 
trying to market in those mm-hmm. individual states that it's not actually creating more ease and flexibility in their life. Mm-hmm. Um, so I also tell people yeah. if, for anybody listening, you can have a virtual practice where you see people from the state you're licensed in, wherever you want to live, it will be okay. <laughs> you yeah, don't have to definitely. be licensed in every state. It, it isn't a magical thing. Um, you know, it's, it's yeah. can be great when it's great, but otherwise it's, it's not necessary for most people. Right. Right. And I think the reason why I'm licensed in Pennsylvania is I'm only, I'm not far from Philadelphia. Mm-hmm. I can make it there in like an hour, hour and a half with no traffic. Right. Mm-hmm. And then Florida, the reason is because you can become a registered only teletherapy in Florida, fairly easy. And I have a lot of people who are snowbirds. So they're here in the summer and then they leave for a couple months. And so I was like, well, legally I can't see you there. And so now it's winter time and you're down in like Key West or wherever in Florida. And now I can't see you. Or I had the other benefit is if you have some college kids too. And, you know, that's hard because they go off to college and now they don't have you. Now they have to start with someone all over again. Um, and I know the wait list at college campus for counseling, because yeah. I know University of Penn, their students that just reached out to me about it. And like they said, the wait list is a couple months. Well, if you start in September, it's a couple months, you're getting in it like November. Now you're on winter break. Yes. And so like, they just, you know, so that's why like I. I wish there was another solution. I think there might be, I know with the LPC, there's a couple of states that are being more reciprocating of that, but I think it's just starting. And there's a a great person center tech has a great Mm -hmm. um, like map where you can click on any of the states and you can see what their rulings are for each of the individual licenses. So if you're like going through your head, trying to figure that out, that's a wonderful resource. Check that out. Yeah. Yeah. So when did you, um, open up your practice like evolving whole? So it's always been evolving, right? So I worked in Philadelphia at an agency and right away, like even when I was in grad school, I knew I always wanted to have my private practice. Um, and so I worked in an agency cause I wanted to gain experience. I wanted to learn like more about what that looks like and have more support. Um, One thing that I would encourage people is definitely find that support system and ask those questions when you're looking for supervision or working at an agency, not all will give that to you. Um, So then when I moved, I was waiting for my license. And so I worked a couple different um, smaller group practices and I was working on a research study. I've always had like eggs in a couple baskets to get. I wanted a lot of experience. I wanted to learn from the people who were, running these group practices kind of in a way. Um, and so I was, as soon as I got licensed, I started my own private practice. Mm -hmm. I still was working at a couple different group practices because I knew that income would kind of just be steady. I could, I knew I would have clients there. I knew I was getting paid, like whether it was bi-weekly or or bi-monthly or like once a month. Mm -hmm. Um, I knew I would have that income as being a single person. I was like, I can't just jump in and start Mm -hmm. a practice. So I slowly grew my practice. Um, and then in June after doing BSB and having like, you guys go, what are you doing? I was like, can I do this? I just took the leap and completely was like, I'm done. I'd been with that one group practice for, you know, six years and I loved them. I loved working with them, but it just wasn't making sense anymore for what I wanted to do. Um, and took that huge leap and it's been to be fully like on my own and not have that, you know, like security blanket, but I didn't need it. I thought I needed it. I think that's the piece too, is like, I, I think we, as, as new business owners, we're sort of looking for some like magical moment or permission from another person that says like, oh, hey, you, you've made it. Um, and now is the time. And like, someone's gonna like knock on your door and be like, this is the time. But it really is something that like, if we're not exploring, if we don't kind of run those numbers and understand, and even we're not exploring what's happening in our heart and mm-hmm. our body and our intuition, it's so easy to kind of like, keep thinking that you're like, oh, that's around the corner. That's around the corner and not Mm -hmm. realize like, oh, I'm here. Like I'm ready. I've been ready and it's time. Mm 
Um, yeah, it's- it was time year. It was time years ago. And I didn't have, you know, as I didn't have a support system as much as like, I had colleagues that they were like, you're so young, you, you like starting a practice. Like there's all these risks, you know, like this person tried and it didn't work. And here's all the work that goes into it. Didn't really have anyone that was mentoring me. Um, and they were like, you know, you're single. How are you going to support yourself? Like it's this huge financial risk. And I'm like, well, mm-hmm. I kind of have taken lots of risks. And if you tell me I can't do something, I'm going to figure out a a way to do it. Um, (laughs) So I was like, "Uh, yeah. So, you know, probably I didn't really like, I crunched some numbers and stuff. Mm -hmm. Then I was like, I can't keep doing this. Like, do I want to do this for another year? Like, and Mm -hmm. especially I think sometimes that, you know, the rate that we're paid at kind of leaves you in this position. Like you either have to go for it and take that big risk because at, like you're, you know, like it wasn't like enough to say, like I saved enough to go do it. Yeah. And I was like, you know, if I take this risk and I fail at it, I'll go back, you know? And I, I had, I had the experience where I, I had started at a couple different group practices mm-hmm. and knew in a way that people found me and however they found me. And I was able to go from like a small caseload to a big caseload pretty quickly at group practices. Mm-hmm. So I think there was some of that confidence in it too. Yeah. You had six years of confidence building up that like, oh, I know how to connect with people. When people come to me, they stay with me and they get great outcomes. They tell their friends and then more people come to me like, I can keep doing this. Right. Oh, that's beautiful. So let's talk a little bit. You know, I I really wanted to focus in on Instagram today because Mm -hmm. I have worked with so many therapists that they're posting the reels and they're posting on their, you know, the, the pretty images and they're hiring social media companies and they're doing all these things. And then we go and look and we, we look at their like marketing stats. We look at their website traffic and there's no traffic coming to in, from Instagram. There's mm-hmm. no clients that found them on Instagram. And they're mm-hmm. saying like, I'm spending like $200 a month and I'm spending 20 hours a month or 20 hours a week sometimes on Instagram. Like, is it worth it? And what they're describing, I'm like, no, that isn't worth it. Yeah. And then you talk with people who are like, oh my gosh, like Instagram is so easy and it brings me clients. Um, And so I love to talk about that juxtaposition Mm -hmm. and hear specific stories and see if we can unpack what is different Mm -hmm. about what you do and how you show up on Instagram and how you connect that actually makes it something that gives you return on investment and connects you with clients. Yeah. Yeah. I think, so the funny thing about Instagram, like, I remember when it first started, it was like, you take the pretty picture and you have a cute caption. Mm-hmm. Part of me wants to, to go back to that because I am Same. not, I like love looking at the pretty pictures, right? So I was like, anything that I posted had to be like my own photograph. And so that was like the start of it and kind of like figuring out how to do that. Um, the other part is I'm actually a super introvert, shy person. And you, a lot of people don't believe that about me because I'm out, I go out and I do things and I just put myself in these uncomfortable situations in a way, like, I'm just going to do it. Even if I'm like by myself, I'm just going to go do it because I don't want to be like living in my house and not leaving my house. Mm -hmm. So I would post stuff and people be like, that's so great. Like you're doing these cool things. And I was like, can you post more? And then I started doing stories, but mostly of like, I live close to the beach. I can walk there in two blocks. So I would like take those pictures and like tag ocean city or like some things that got me some more followers. Friends would kind of share or comment on some of those things. Um, And so it just kind of started happening naturally. And then I would come on and talk a little bit but they were like, never, it was just kind of me, almost like a rant. I would just come on and be like, here's a thought. And I would just like ramble Mm -hmm. on Instagram. People were like, this is great. Like, it's like the real you. Mm -hmm. And I think as therapists, at least like when I was in grad school, it was like, you know, like don't have, don't, you need to be a blank slate. Like if you have an office space, like have it really blank, don't have like any personal photographs. Mm -hmm. Like I remember this whole conversation, like, do you, don't you wear a wedding ring if you're married? like all of these. And I'm like, and like dress a certain way. And like, that's one reason why I wanted to be in private practice because I was like, I don't want to be in a business suit 
you know, I was working with kids too. I'm like, I got, I go, I get on the floor with people like, you know, like I'm not going to be in like heels and a, you know, and I want to wear my <laughs> style. Yeah. I so was with my, I like my just, Worthington slacks on the ground. Just like, okay, great. Yeah, like yeah. trying to find the cheapest slacks possible because I'm literally on a dirty nonprofit floor. <laughs> right. Right. Who knows when it was actually cleaned last. Right. You're like, and so, so I started like just posting, like just me talking about things, like whether I, you know, some of it's personal, it might be like something I'm struggling with could be like some type of challenge, um, that I went through and like how I kind of worked through it. Or I like telling a lot of stories. And I think that gives people a way to connect with me. Mm -hmm. Um, The other part, I think during COVID, when that hit, like I started doing more stories just to kind of connect with people because people, you know, they weren't connecting with anyone. And so if they could see like a familiar face, you know, I have some clients that follow me or some people who just know me and they were like, this is helpful. And it would just be me talk like showing up and talking, whatever came to mind that day. Mm-hmm. Um, it could be after I was done like paddle boarding or surfing. And I would be like, this happened. I remember there was one where like, I got crushed by this wave mm-hmm. and I like got out of the water and I was like, oh my God, but I was glad I did it. You know, and there's like a lesson in some of these experiences and kind of, mm-hmm. you know, show people that there's other things that they can be doing, like go paddle boarding, go hiking. Here's like locations that I like to go to. Mm -hmm. Um, especially like the beginning of COVID where we couldn't go anywhere. Like, how can you wander around in your neighborhood? Like, yeah, I can walk to the beach. Like it's two blocks, but I started walking. Well, they closed our beaches at one point. So I started walking around the neighborhood and I was like, wow, like, look at these houses, like, look at these flowers. So I'd take pictures and be like, go adventure in your own neighborhood. And I think that like got more people to kind of follow me. You know, I talk about like my workouts and things like that, books that I'm reading. And just that's how I think just being authentically me and connecting with people and like showing that side, but also giving like some type of story or metaphor that they can relate to their life. So tell me of this, because I, there, I'm sure there are people who are listening who are super pumped up and inspired by this. Mm -hmm. And then there's other people who are like, just exhausted by the idea. And what I hear um, is that like you as an introvert um, and as someone who is on the shire side, which is like, I'm definitely an ambivert. I can kind of bounce between, but I, <laughs> I tend more towards introvert um, that this was something that was really energizing you. This wasn't mm-hmm. something you were like forcing yourself to do. It doesn't sound like, tell me about that. Mm-hmm. Tell me about yeah. what it feels like in your body when you knew that you were ready and you were energized to do it versus what it would look like on a day where you might be like, Oh, I'm going to skip today's not the day. Like, mm-hmm. how do you, how do you read in your own energy when you're ready to show up in that way? Yeah. I think, I think it's really being mindful and having that awareness of like how my body feels and like, what's my headspace that day? Am I doing things to take care of myself? There have been times that I've like hopped on a story and I'm like, I don't want to go for this walk. I am cranky. I am miserable. I don't want to do it. And I'm going for a walk for five minutes. And if I want to turn around, I'm turning around and going home. If I want to go longer, I'll keep going. And that's something that I teach my clients. Mm -hmm. So like get up and kind of do something. Now there's other days where I'm like, yeah, I'm not going for that walk. Like, it's okay. I give myself that permission to say it's okay. Um, and again, it's, it's coming from like, it's me. I'm not like, Mm -hmm doing it because I have a schedule for it. You know, it's more of like how I feel. I can't, you know, I think about like having a content schedule and I know, and I've read like all kinds of information, like have these posts on Monday, have this on. I think that's great. If that works for you, go for it. Um, for me, that feels stressful and pressured and I can't be as creative. Like I might not wake up on, you know, Tuesday morning and feel like talking to anyone, you know, so getting on and doing a story is going to be challenging. I'm not going to come off as great. I might not write my best content. Um, so for me, it's really like, I kind of batch it when I have the energy, I do it when I don't, I don't. And I go do something else that may energize me that day. Mm-hmm. I think that's the, it's such an important piece when it comes to social media is that 
forcing it. Like, yeah, there may be a time in the beginning where you're playing with something new and you're gonna, mm -hmm. you're pushing your edges, you're going outside of your comfort zone mm -hmm. and you just don't know how it's gonna feel. So you gotta try it on for size. But there is a place of like, if it feels like just a slog, that people don't engage with people who are like consistently miserable. <laughs> I think, right. you know, like your ability to come on and say like, oh, today is hard um, was inspiring because there are other days when you're like, oh, this was amazing. And like, oh, wait, you know what? God bless, coming back to check in, been walking for 90 minutes. Mm -hmm. I feel mm -hmm. like my whole energy shifted or like, oh, five minutes. I went and got a donut going home, you know, like whatever <laughs> yeah, the thing was <laughs> that people could like connect in with both sides of that yeah. space of you like honoring yourself. Um, and, and I think there is like a whole, <laughs> I don't know why this phrase is coming up, but there's been a lot of people like deconstructing faith and like deconstructing capitalism and deconstructing, you know, like um, colonialism and what have you. Mm -hmm. I think there's really a deconstruction happening in our field, like a deconstruction of psychotherapy and this idea of like me as the expert, um, you know, removed and this person over here. And we're kind of coming into this place of like, Hey, no, like we, we should be together. Like yeah. there should be like a, um, an ease in here and, and a safety that's not there when I go in on this, you know, in this other space on this pedestal. Um, and I love seeing that shift um, mm -hmm. over time. Like it just inspires me so much to know that um, maybe, maybe there's going to be less clients that go out and I mean, we've all heard this, heard experiences and had clients who've experienced um, really unhealthy dynamics inside of therapy relationships. Mm -hmm. And they thought that that was normal because I'm supposed to go and like listen to this expert and I, and I don't trust my intuition. And so the mm -hmm. more that they see the realness of therapists and they start to connect in and they know what that's kind of like, we change the norm of what it's supposed to feel like. It's not supposed mm -hmm. to feel uncomfortable. It's not supposed right. to feel narcissistic. It's not supposed to feel less than. Um, then I feel like it, it changes the narrative and it creates a, a healthier expectation than, oh, I saw on TV that this is how therapists are. Mm -hmm. Um, and, you know, and, you know, you have a pretty good chance of sleeping with your therapist because that's what happens in like it's seven out of 10 TV or movies with a therapist, you know, right. like let's change all of it. Yeah. And I think because it can be, it's not that I'm the expert necessarily, like mm -hmm. let's collaborate, let's find what works for you. Let's try some different things. Let me be your cheerleader. Let me be your rock. But you know, like if I don't know the answer to, like I tell my clients, if I don't know, let's go, I'll, I'll find, like, I'll talk to other therapists and like, I'll do some research. Like I want to find something that's great for you. You know, and I have clients like people not even clients, but people that reach out to me on Instagram, they're like, where's that hiking spot? Oh, but I live in Virginia. And I'm like, oh, I've been to Virginia. Here's a place to go, you know? And if not, here's, here's an app or something like, here's yeah. how I look for them. You know, like, I like that kind of like, let's collaborate, give me ideas too. Yeah. Um, and so I think it makes, I feel like I'm more myself then, and I can be a better version of myself for mm -hmm. clients or for you know, when I come home from work or, you know, when I talk to other colleagues, so it just feels better. Hmm. So can, I want to ask you some like logistical mm -hmm. questions. Yeah. You mentioned like tagging, um, tagging cities, tagging other or mm -hmm. tagging locations. How much do you do location tagging versus like uh, where you tag an actual account versus mm -hmm. tagging like a location tag, like a hashtag? So I, I, I make sure I have some hashtags. And again, you can go down a rabbit hole and read tons. Like you should have 20, have no more than 30. <laughs> I say, go what feels right. Like sometimes coming up with that, like people come up with amazing hashtags. I just go what feels right. I keep in my notes section on my phone, like a list of ones. Or if I'm following other accounts, like I often see what their hashtags are. Yeah. I jot them down. So that way I can copy and paste. It just makes it easier for me. So I don't, again, like I don't, I'm not stressing about any of it. There are times where I put the location um, 
and I'll pick Ocean City or sometimes I'll pick another location. I sometimes, if I'm traveling, there are times where I might be posting. I, and if I post an image, like I love going to Shenandoah National Park, it's one of my mm-hmm. favorite places. Um, if I'm traveling there and I do a post, I won't because I'm traveling and I travel by myself with my dog. Um, I don't yeah. put where my location is. I go back on that post and I will add it after I'm done traveling. Um, just for a safety thing. Um, I love that. I love yeah. that. But I do like, I like giving recommendations to people. So if I, I might post a day or two later too, um, you know, like I'll tag a restaurant um, and I'll tag some other uh, businesses too. And I think that's a way because then they might share to their story um, or like other therapists, like I might tag in my post or in my story um, and then they can choose to share it or it shows up in, I forget what that's called, like where the other tags are, you know, like it kind of shows up if people are like snooping through there and it kind of gives a good idea. Awesome. Yeah. And then uh, from the time that you started kind of playing more on Instagram, Mm-hmm. How long did it take for people to actually start reaching out to become clients? I pro- I had that account for a year, but I was never really active on it. Mm-hmm. Um, and then I became more active. And I mean, pretty quickly, people started reaching out. Mm-hmm. Um, they would either DM me or they would then go to the link to my website or find my psychology today. I think more people will then either find my Instagram and then search my name Mm -hmm. and then find me and then like scope me out on, you know, psychology today, my website, anything else that they can find me. Um, which I think is great. Cause like, as long as not my personal stuff, I don't mind, you know, and I have my personal stuff like as locked down as I can, but you know, I think that's great because then when they call for that first consult, they kind of have an idea of who I am. Yeah. You know, they already have that feeling of like, oh, this is her personality. Like these are the things that she does. And so that's been a great way for me to find my ideal clients because they go, oh, you either went to university Penn. Oh, I paddle border. Oh, I'm an, I'm an old athlete, you know, like, oh, I've done CrossFit, like anything like that. So they already know that there's some type of connection mm-hmm. with me. Um, or some people have found me through psychology today and then come on my Instagram. And the reason why they actually reach out to me is because they've seen that. So when I do the initial kind of conversation, I'm like, how did you find me? And they say, Instagram, like that's exciting. Yeah. And I think that's the other part too, is that sometimes if you're not asking the question, you may not get the answer. Right. Mm -hmm. And so it's such an important part and something we teach in business school. They always ask people, how did you find me? Write it down, keep a running tally um, on your marketing plan so that you can go back and go like, Oh yeah, that was totally worth my time. That was fantastic. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Now, do you want to share your, um, your handle, your Insta handle with the people listening? If yeah. they want to go and check you out, follow for inspiration, maybe connect, tag yeah. you and yeah, I would love that. And Insta like the therapist. Yeah. Like, so it's evolving whole. Um, with and the yeah, WH, right? WH. Yeah. Um, So really what that comes from, I'll explain like the name of my business a little bit. So whole is when you're feeling whole, you're grounded, you're rational. And as you want to evolve and kind of grow, it's, it comes from a healthier place. If you're whole, you know, when you're feeling irrational and you're feeling anxious and like fearful and frustrated, you may not make the best decisions or you may not move at all, right? You get Mm -hmm. stuck. So if you can kind of find a way to ground yourself in being whole, Mm -hmm. have those anchors, it becomes easier to evolve into whatever place you want. Now, as you evolve, some of those anchors will shift and change too. So it's kind of like this constant growth, but having people really find ways to anchor themselves. And I like to share ways that I anchor myself or things that I've tried. You know, like I kind of want to try cross stitch or needlepoint. Oh. Like that's new on my, <laughs> yeah. Like, uh, yeah. Like, so I'm, like, I'm like, that sounds fun. So like I ordered a kit, I'm waiting for it to come. And then like, if I may like it, I may not, but then I'll share that on my yeah. social media, you know, to give other people ideas of things that they can do. Doesn't have to be, you don't have to climb mountains or go paddleboard yeah. in the ocean like I do, but there's lots of other things that you can do. 
It reminds me, I know this is going to sound a little bit cheesy, but it reminds me of the missing piece in the big O, right? Um, that mm-hmm. there's this person like kind of going through life, feeling like they're broken and they're looking for mm-hmm. someone else to fill them up and it doesn't work. And then they right. start kind of moving and scratching out the edges and they realize like, oh, I'm, I am whole. And mm-hmm. then as they start kind of going out through life, they get, they're able to grow, like and kind of yeah. get bigger and shift and they can grow along next, you know, along with other yeah. people. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I, yeah. I think it's so... Um, I think there, what we do in one thing is what we do in everything. Mm -hmm. And so what that means is like, you're saying like everything that we do different, everything that we do the same is an opportunity for growth, whether it's Mm -hmm. needlepoint, whether it's a walk in the neighborhood, whether it's learning Mm -hmm. photography, whether it's sitting and meditating or going to church Mm -hmm. or whatever the thing is, like, it's a place for us to like experience grow and retrain mm-hmm. our brain and there is I think there is a lot of anxiety in our society and a lot of feeling feel people feeling really broken right now mm-hmm. in particular and to realize mm-hmm. like oh maybe we're not broken you know maybe we are whole but we are feeling like we need evolving yeah <laughs> we need growth. yeah, yeah. Yeah. In some area, you yeah. need something to kind of change. You know, you yeah. feel like every day you're doing the same thing. Well, what can you do to change that? Yeah. You know, sometimes it's, it's easy if you like, you always like drive the same way to work and you can take an alternate route, just take that. And who knows what you're going to see along the yeah. way, you know, keep your eyes open. You might like find a new coffee shop or like, find, like, you know, it's, it can be, that's why like, I get so frustrated because around here, I'm like in this big tourist town. And as soon as like summer ends, like every road's under construction and it could take you forever to go from like point A to point B. And you're like, it's a maze, right? Like detour, you hit every detour, you go like, you make a right. And then they're like detour again, you know, (laughs) it's a funny joke. But I think that when I do that, instead of getting frustrated, I'm like, what can I see? And it's Mm -hmm. often like streets that like, I'm like, oh, I never noticed that house before because I'm always driving the exact same way. Mm -hmm. So like sometimes to make an easy change in life is like, walk a different way. If you, Mm -hmm. you know, always walk out of your house and you go for a walk instead of going right, go left, Mm -hmm. you know, and see where it takes you, Mm -hmm. you know, beautiful. It's beautiful. Yeah. So what is, as we kind of wrap up, um, Mm -hmm. if there are other people out there like you, who maybe they're at that place of, um, feeling like on the edge, like you talked Mm -hmm. about being kind of stuck not stuck, but like in group practice a little longer than you should have Mm -hmm. kind of feeling like, um, you were getting a lot of messages from other people saying, well, you're single, it's too big a risk. It's not Mm going to work for you. What's a message you'd want to give to somebody who was at that place where you were, you know, a year or two ago, just go go for it. I mean, my other thought when I made that jump was like, well, I can always go back. I can always go work for a group practice if this doesn't pan out, you know? And I, at one point I was like, I'm not giving myself that option though. There's no other option. If I have a very specific way that I want to live my life, even that at one point I was like, going back to a group practice is not, that's not an option for Mm -hmm. me. So let's make it work and figure out ways to make it work. And I think really it's kind of like an experiment with yourself, you know, taking notes on like, what am I doing this month, this week? And is that working? Is that not working? You know, what kind of, and finding what works for you, um, I think is so important. And one other thing is on Instagram, you're going to have trolls. You're going to have people that say things or challenge your ideas. And on days where you're feeling more half and you're not feeling as grounded, they're going to like really impact you. So making sure you have that support system, like when you see it, don't respond (laughs) right away. (laughs) Find those people that you can talk through, get outside, go for a walk. It's going to happen. Um, and people are going to disagree with you. And that's hard. Like, especially as like, I know me personally, like that's like, Oh, they've hit, like they've hit hard you know, sometimes where I'm like having fun and people are like, what are you doing? You know, like I like wearing wigs and I ha- did a couple posts with wigs and someone was like, you can't wear that type of wig. And I was like, I wasn't, you know, like I was doing it out of fun. And I did, I checked in with other people. I was like, well, am I doing something that's wrong? Like, am I doing something that's wrong? Like, can you support me? Let's have a, have 
find people that you can have com- different conversations with around yeah. those things too. Like, can you call me yeah. out? Is this offensive? Is this crossing yeah. a boundary or a line right. or is there room yeah. to like be playful and, and loving and right. have you? Yeah. Right? What does it look yeah. like? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Or people like having different, you know, cause I, I, you know, like the other day I posted something about giving yourself permission to like take a break, you know, like maybe mm-hmm. not finish the dishes in the sink and go meditate or go for a walk, do something for you. And I even said like, students, I know teachers are going to freak out at me. I was like, if you need a mental health day from doing homework, take that day. And I had someone that like instantly responded, like someone I don't know, like, (laughs) I was like, oh, and like, I was in a good place that I was like, well, I've worked in a school. I work with lots of teachers. Like mental health is important. Like, I'm not saying never do homework. I'm not saying never do the dishes, but give yourself permission. So had that been a, a, a different day that I was not so grounded in myself, that simple thing could have like rocked me, yeah. you know? So I think like also have that awareness and kind of like take care of yourself and build that support to some of friends that you can reach out mm-hmm. colleagues and say like, Hey, like this happened, like, you know, I, I love that. Too. And I think that's the other part too. Even if you're assessing, you know, going, going out into social media. And if that's an area where you're like, Oh, that would like wreck me for weeks. That may mm-hmm. be a time to say, and, and I always give people, everyone permission. Social media can be amazing. You do not have mm-hmm. to do social media to have a successful business. It is one option right. for marketing. And mm-hmm. if it is an option for marketing that leaves you feeling less than or miserable Don't or exhausted, it. yeah, like not worth it. Nothing is worth, nothing yeah. is worth your mental health. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Cause yeah. there's a lot of therapists out there that have no social media, yeah. you know, and they are just as successful. Like, I don't think you need to have that, you know, to, to really be successful. I think no, it, you it, have a good, you have a good website and you have some good, you know, networking and I'm not the best at networking. Like that's a place mm-hmm. I'm trying to push myself. And I created a networking group, mm-hmm. but that's a place that like, I have to push myself, mm-hmm. you know, and, but other people are rock stars at networking. They know like yeah. every therapist in the area, they know like <laughs> everyone. And I'm like, I know people on social media kind of <laughs> right you're the rock star on you social know. media they're the rock star yeah. networking and we'll, so we kind of find some ways through that process mm-hmm. oh I love this I love this I love yeah. this so go and check out Abby Sangmeister at evolvingwhole.com and on Instagram at evolving whole w-h-o-l-e uh, for inspiration and connection. Sounds like she's looking to network yeah. more with awesome therapists. Nice. So if you're there in uh, Philadelphia, New Jersey, or Florida, <laughs> check out Abby. Um, yeah. Yeah. And of course, know that we here at ZinniMe are here to support you through your process, whether you're trying to grow your practice, you're starting it from scratch, successful, or you're moving to that group practice, We got you. We've been there and done that over 25 years of coaching experience. Um, So go check out zenime.com for some wonderful free resources today. Until next time, y'all. See you soon.